right, sports fans, we are back for, I think it's discussion number three, defensive infield discussion number three, right, Tone? I think this is it, something like that. And what yeah. it is, just uh, people getting together, talking the game. And so tonight we've got Tony Medina, who's been on us with our first couple of calls. And then we've got George Araujo, which, I, again, there's so many different ways I can describe you and bring you in, George. But let's just say a, a, a longtime colleague. How's that for a boring kind of intro? But, uh, you know, we, we George, Perfect. and I go back a, a long time. Uh, it's almost like us three somewhere. We had a family reunion together hundreds of years ago or something. I don't know. So it just seems like there's so many like ways that we talk the game and the synergy that we've always had. So wanted to bring you both both aboard and let's talk the game a little bit. I mean, I think Thanks, for us, man. we're uh, the pocket is is what infield, right? And and talking infielders, middle infielders. And so what I'm going to do is I've got a little. I like to get not too fancy, but I got a little presentation. I'm going to start here. So discussion number three, right? And having George in here, and again, just in that pocket of, of middle infielders. So George sends me this clip, and this is just one of those clips, guys, that I think we could watch. Like, I could go to sleep to this. Like, I don't know. I'm old enough yeah. to remember Fred Astaire, right? But this yeah. is, how do you, how do you uh, it's going to loop. So how do, you, how do you describe this when you see this stuff, guys, like to your eyes? And George, why did you send me this particular clip? I, you know, I, I thought this was pretty cool because – um, I guess philosophically, this is kind of what I like to teach here, you know, and, and uh, the quick separation of the, of the hands, if you guys notice the quick separation of the hands there, um, you know, it's really not going into a funnel or a gather, but it's going right from fielding the ground ball into a quick transition to quick transfer. Oops. And there goes the, there it goes the presentation. All right. Let's try oh yeah. That was another Keep one right there. Keep it the, looping. There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah so what I try beautiful. to do is try to get in those spots right in there, right? Tony and I talk a lot about, about receiving the ball, kind of what's being said out there, what's being taught. <clears throat> you know, uh, it, it's kind of funny too, George, because I know, I think, uh, when was it? A few years ago in Hammett at the On Deck Alistair camp. Uh, in between, I think we had a break and, and you and I were in the dugout and we were talking and we were talking about funneling. And, you know, and again, anytime I get a chance, I'm a big fan of yours. I, I want to pick your brain as much as possible. And we were talking about funneling opposed to not funneling. And you were saying, well, you know, uh, softball's a lot quicker. So, you know, to actually come all the way to the chest and separate is kind of something we want to stay away from, especially today with the, you know, the, the speed of these slappers getting down that line. So you were saying kind of, you know, those soft hands bringing in a little bit, but separating as we get forward and as we land, we're already separated. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I know we talked about that last time. You were, yeah, exactly. You yeah, exactly. I, I do remember that, man. I mean, anytime I can have those conversations, right, it's, it's, it's sweet, you know, and when, when we all get together and talk about that stuff. But yeah, I, I think in my, uh, you know, you have, you have basically, there's probably a few more, but in general, you have the three different types of fielders, right? You have the, the, the kids like to funnel, or the, I should say the coaches like to teach funneling, which is okay. You know, that's, that's a good way to do it if a kid can do it. Um, now, I think the, the, and I think this is what I mentioned to you there, Tony, is like, it's, hey, this is going to be easy with two Tonys, man. It's, I just got to say <laughs> yeah, Tony, so, I'm talking to so both of like, you. <laughs> I'd like to be Tony number one. And so, you know, and then he, whatever number you want to give that other Tony, that's totally cool. T and T, yeah, brother. It's T perfect. Doesn't, Boom, doesn't, right? get, doesn't get easier T than this. But yeah, no, I, I think you, you have the funnelers, right? And the guys that like to teach funneling and, or, or, the, or the female coaches. There's some great female coaches out there, too. Um, you know, the problem that I've seen with, with funneling a lot is, is that you tend to create a little bit of long hops, right? So when those hands are coming in and kids tend to funnel a little bit too early, your, your, your timing has to be pretty, pretty well executed um, because you tend, they tend to bring their hands in a little bit too early. They're, the hop gets long on them, you know, and I have that saying, when you allow a hop to get long, it has a chance to go wrong. So yeah, uh, it kind of creates that a little bit, a little bit of a longer hop. Uh, don't get me wrong. There's many times where you have to funnel, right? That hard hit ground ball, you got to give in and you have to, you have to cushion that ball a lot. But, you know, uh, that's funny too, because there's another instructor I was watching and, and, and I'm always uh, amazed on how um, versatile different players are. So they, you know, you might take one player that funnels really well and then another player that kind of just funnels a little bit and separates. And, and even last uh, time, Tony, we, we were talking about this gal, no funnel whatsoever, just barely coming in and separate and releases the ball. Um, but I, I do at a young age, you know, like to teach a little funneling, uh, kind of creates your timing and rhythm in out. And as your feet land, you're separated. 
Uh, but as we get older, of course, you know, again, th those players are getting in that line. We don't have that kind of time in softball. And I, and, and, I, and I do recall when we were talking about that, you were mentioning, you know, it's a different level. And so, you know, but remember, Lovey, I think we worked uh, that Lakewood camp with George Monaulu um, uh, years ago. And I got a chance to see her. And so I was watching her videos and, you know, even with Mike Kendra and they come in. Uh, but, but, you know, teach his zone. And, and I, you know, I, I, again, as we, you get older, we don't have that time. And, and I see that more often now. I think that's something yeah, that, and, I, that you know, I want. That's something that I want our coaches and anybody that's watching is to understand that when we're, we're, we're we look at this like we're three chefs in the kitchen. So we're, we're not going to say this way is the only way or this way is the better way. We're going to talk about why it is that we do what we do. And I, I always love uh, um, a difference of approach, right? I mean, if we're all saying the same type of thing. So I'm, I'm on the other end. I'm going to, I'm going to big time start with a funnel. I'm going to create pure and then I'm going to work towards shortening it up. We all have different approaches. The bottom line is, Hey, can George deliver? Is he, is his infielders, do they do the job? You know, Tony, have your infielders done anything? Has any of our kids kind of went on done anything? So when you, when you look at someone that's successful, I mean, you can talk about the recipe, but you don't, you don't argue with someone's success. So when someone's successful, what I encourage coaches to do is take what you, what works for you, but take success because what is it? It might not be the recipe. It might be the way somebody's teaching the game. It might be somebody, the way they articulate it. Uh, the way that I look at it is, is it's becoming one with the ball. I mean, if anything in this video that we just started is that guy's one yeah. with the ball. I mean, they're like one, they're like dancing together. And so learning to read the hops, learning be, to become a rhythmic fielder, right? When to, when to meet the ball, when to separate, when to gather it all the way in, when you don't need to, you know, there's, those are all feels for the game that I want, any coaches that are, are listening to understand that that's really our intent is we're going to have some difference of opinions, but we don't need to defend our opinions. It's really kind of the beauty of the game because bottom line is, listen, you guys are both have plenty of success in what you do and we don't want to mess with that. I think that sometimes that's what softball kind of gets lost to because everyone's got an opinion. And it's like, I tell pitchers, look, I know you take pitching lessons, but you don't know how to pitch. And I got a lot of hitters that take hitting lessons, but they don't know how to hit. I got a lot of people that take the lessons in general for fielding, but they don't know how to field. So bottom line is we want to share things with people that allow them to develop successful players, successful operations. I want to show you guys, I want to go to my next clip here. And then before we go on, because it's kind of a time sensitive thing. So when we talk about being rhythmic and then we talk about rhythmic infielders, right, George? So this kid, remember her? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Not, not, not too shabby. Katie Medina, right? Not too shabby. Like, how would you describe her in your, uh, she, she was one of your first uh, kind of protégés and kids off your team, right? And Yeah, kind of yeah, she was. She, uh, you know, she came in, started playing with me. I think Jen and Under was our first, you know, first time. Oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> hey, how did you? How did she get? This is oh, kind of like you got to be kidding me on this one. Hey, oh, that's awesome. hey George Rollins, this kidding. is your life. <laughs> yeah, this is my life. Wow. Oh yeah, man, that's pretty I'm cool. Check my heart right here. <laughs> Look at that, Katie. Katie. It worked. Yeah, wow. we got him. <laughs> that, is, awesome. that is so awesome. Super cool. Well, gosh, yeah, George, well, let, let's keep you in the moment, please. right, Katie? We were just talking about kind of some of the beginnings, and we're talking about rhythmic fielders. So, tell tell me about Katie Medina and what your first memories were of her, George, and how that kind of came came to be. And welcome, well, Katie. yeah. So, Katie was just uh, very rhythmic from from a young age. You know, she just had that rhythm, and she had that uh, the tenacity of a good infielder. You know, that grit, uh, low key grit. Like you wouldn't, you'd have to watch her for a while. You have to spend a week or two with her and, and her having her play right there. Uh, but man, you talk about just tenacious and wanting to be in the game every single time. I mean, there was, she never wanted to be out of the game. I don't know if you remember that Katie, but she wanted to play, you know, every inning and have every at bat. And there was just a sense of uh, tenacity to her. And what, what age, Katie, what, what age did you meet George at? I met George when I was eight years old. And George, no. she got the same smile, doesn't she? Yeah, hasn't changed, right? <laughs> so, so we brought on Katie Medina, and, and again, a lot of us go go way back, but but you know, Katie went on to to take the stage at the highest level, right? And so, when we talk about opportunities, and it's and it's not about for us, it's not about gender and race and different things, but just opportunities for people and people providing opportunities for themselves, being able to provide opportunities for their families. And so, Katie going on and taking the flag and really taking it on to that highest level, George, who would have thought, right? I mean, we, I know we didn't doubt it, but when we saw it happen, what was that like for you watching her go 
go all the way up. And then Katie, we're going to get into you a little bit and your, your uh, memories of George. But what was that like for you, George, watching her kind of go all the way up to the success level that she had? Well, you know, it was, it was, uh, is that kid from the neighborhood, right? From my own my own backyard and the, our city park, right? Rec ball and, and all that coming out and making it, you know, making it at the highest level. It was just, uh, it was Fun just impressive. Watch. Yeah, and as coaches and teachers, right? You guys, both Tonys know this. That's that's one of our biggest reward, right? Is when we see our kids succeed at the highest level because that's what that's what we're trying to do. You know, whether you're, uh, you know, your school teacher teaching a kid, you know, about, you know, whatever, science or whatever, and he goes on or she goes on to become a, big time scientist and you're just fired up and you get excited about it. Same thing with Katie to watch her on the big stage and perform. So you know, she knows what it's like to uh, drag that field with the chain link fence then. And, and was it a carpet or <laughs> chain link fence over there at Patterson field? I'm trying to trying to remember what used to drag the field with, but got to remember those days, Katie, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, most definitely. <laughs> and, and then and then going on all the way to the to the stage at Florida, right? So that yeah, you know, basically, I mean, everything becomes manicured and everything else. But but Katie, what was that like? What do you remember about playing for George and kind of those beginning years and, and becoming a middle infielder? Is that where you started? Were you having an outfielder, a pitcher, or anything else, or did you start right at the shortstop spot? I actually started at third base my very first season when I um, started softball, and Coach George actually is the one who put me at shortstop, and I never left. So I fell in love with it. And um, I would have to say, Coach George, um, to this day, your stories, your life stories, everything that you (laughs) taught us, all the little things um, have I've taken into my life, not only on the field, but off of the field. And I couldn't thank you enough for everything that you taught us, because everything that you instilled in me was for more than just the game. And I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't thank you enough for everything, all the life lessons. But I always remember um, just the the drills, the things that he would incorporate into our practices and his want for us to be better people and his want for us to be um, the best of the best. And you can definitely tell in his passion and everything that he did when he was uh, coaching us, it transcended into everyday life. And I know for me, every time I went to practice, I was fired up. I was fired up to hear what else he had to say, what else he had to teach me, because I, I, I was just a big sponge. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to, to kind of just take everything in. And even from age eight to the age, what, 13, before I, I went over to you, Tony, <laughs> I just um, remember how he just was so passionate about the game, and I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be somebody who every time I stepped on the field, you knew I was on the field and you knew that I was there and I meant business and that, you know, I was going to make a difference. And so every time I think back, I'm just very grateful to have started with a coach so passionate like Coach George. We think about the the importance of being inspired, right? And so, you know, back then when you started, I mean, was, was softball your thing or was it something that you did? Because you could have went a lot of ways. I've always looked at you as a very diverse person. So where was softball in your life? And kind of where was it priority wise when you first started? The funny thing is, is that um, I actually started softball because I was invited by a neighbor. It was somebody that was like, hey, I'm going to go try out for the softball team. You should come with me. And and I looked over at my parents. I was like, okay. I mean, and then so my mom was like, yeah, we'll definitely, we'll try it out. But at that point in my life, karate was a big part of my life. Right. And right. I was very passionate about karate. And I loved that. And for me, that's where I broke out of my shell. And it's funny because Coach George says that, you know, I was more of the timid type. Um, you can imagine me before karate. So, <laughs> um I was very, um, I I loved karate and I was very diverse in what I, in like the sports that I played and the things that I did, but softball was on the back burner for me at first. But once I got on the field with somebody like George, when I got on the field and was put into the game and once I started learning and trying to, you know, get a good feel for it, that's when I absolutely fell in love with softball. And yes, I played sports like volleyball, tennis, and I kept continuing to play other sports throughout uh, my life until Florida, but um, I think that was more so just to, you know, pick up other skills. And I feel like you learn so much when you do other sports. But after I started softball, I think that's when it was a flip of a switch from karate to softball. And you started martial arts at what age? I started martial arts when I was six. So I was in there for a good two years before. 
I remember when mm -hmm. you came to our program and somebody had mentioned to me, it's like, Katie's like, can take care of herself. So I'm like, get out of here. That little soft <laughs> little Katie, you kidding me? I'm like, Katie, show you me something. And you're like, it. and you're like, Tony, I don't want to. I'm like, Katie, just do it. And I, I know you remember this. You kind of, you put your foot inside my foot. And you just gave me like a little bit of push, right? Because it's about the leverage that she understood how to use. And I mean, I went like right over and she just like barely touched me. And I was like, what? And then she gave me that smile. Like, you know, I could really hurt you if I wanted to. Like, it was just, it was pretty, pretty cool to understand that, that, that part of you. A couple of things that I want to ask you. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe this is obvious. If, if practicing with George wasn't inspiring and wasn't fun, you, you maybe not have stuck with the sport. I mean, I mean, isn't that a message to our coaches that are, are going to be watching this is that, you know, we're always teaching, right? We're always correcting. And we all have our moments, mm -hmm. but how important is instilling fun into practice, especially at the younger ages? I think it's essential, honestly, for, for kids who want a chance to play this sport is it needs to be fun, especially at that age where you're, you're just learning the sport and you're trying to see if it's going to be something for you. If it's not fun, you're going to think of it as a chore. You know, you're going to think of it as something that you're more, you know, you're just kind of showing up. There's not going to be that passion behind it. I know for me, that was the biggest thing. And what led me to be the fielder that I was, the player that I was, the person that I am today is the passion behind it and the want to get better the want to know more about the sport, the want to, you know, to just be the best in it. And I feel like if it wasn't fun, if I didn't look, like look forward to the true stories or the what can I learn today, I feel like it would have been a, a huge shift in my life and who knows where I would be at now. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And it's always important hearing it from a player. I can tell you that's, you know, Tony Medina's on the call and there's no, no relation with you. But I, like I, we mentioned earlier, I feel like we're all related in some other realm or some other place. But, you know, you watch, you watch these guys when they're doing their workouts and they're fun to even watch, right? They're you know, fun mm -hmm. to watch George's classes. They're fun to watch Tony's classes. And I think that's a big part of it. I think we get lost in that as coaches sometimes. You know, sometimes we have to dis disrupt things and change the course a little bit, but that's really important. Katie, one more question I had for you before I move on and, and bring the guys a little bit more is the importance of uh, your athleticism. So mar martial arts, what did that help you do? Get to know your body, control, self body control, because that's something that as you start to explain this, I'm going to pull up one of your clips here, but how would you relate the importance of martial arts and what you were able to do athletically? I think it played a huge role in just how I was able to move and just, um, body awareness and being able to really understand what I could do, how I can do it. And um, I was very fortunate to have started with martial arts where, you know, at first I was trying to figure out, you know, how to get things done. Cause my mindset is very like um, technical and I learned how to, to trust myself essentially. And I learned that sometimes you don't need to always, um, you know, have something in mind in order for you to be able to perform and for able to, for you to to do things. So I think I I learned to not only um, just kind of trust myself, but I learned the skills needed to just kind of um, move more agilely. I right. guess is a good way of putting right. it. Right, increase your increase your agility. Absolutely, George. What do you remember about Katie coming out in the first couple of practices and kind of when you were able to start working with her and your first first memories of her on the field? I said, we're finally going to win a national championship. <laughs> hey. You got to have a shortstop, man, to do stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's funny that there's a play that you showed. She's going up the middle and touches second base. You know, we, we call those spin fives. I don't know yeah. if you remember that, Katie, but. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So we used to work on those spin five plays all the time, you know, and get creating that, you know, the great athletes, right? Whether you're a diver or an ice, ice skater or whatever it is, you have kinesthetic awareness, you know, and you have, you have control of your muscles and you spin or for example, a diver will dive. And right before they hit that water, man, they know where their body's at and how they're going in, whether it's, you know, hands first or feet first, but they're very aware of their body. And Katie had that at a very young age. Um, and I, I picked up on that really fast that she had, you know, she had that. And she also had the soft hands to go along with it. So all those things, uh, along with her wanting to be in the game, you know, and wanted the ball hit to her. And she was very relaxed, you know, very relaxed players. Um, we always talk about hard hands and we talk about, oh yeah, that kid has hard hands or whatever, but you know, we rarely talk about why a kid has hard hands, right? And most kids that have hard hands or stone hands is because they're not relaxed. You know, they're very tense. That's just like hitters, right? They tighten up to feel the ground ball. And Katie, for some reason, was able to stay relaxed as she's fielding ground balls and create those soft hands. So those are the things that stick out. 
And Tone, what would you say is the common denominator with, with you know, what you've seen as Katie's style, the things that you see and that you like? Well, what's the common denominator from these? We talk about what separates the best from the rest, right? So what is that denominator that you see at the, with the elite level? Oh, first with Katie and, and even with George, I know my first experience uh, when I met George, I think it was like 12 years ago at Artesia Park. And, and yeah. uh, one of my buddies that I ran into that day, uh, I think it was Bobby Carrillo. Uh, and, and, and you guys, right before Friendly, you guys were uh, doing a little pregame uh, workout, and I was just blown away, first of all, that you were even out there, George, demonstrating the drills. And I was like, who is this guy? That's my guy? favorite. Right? I mean, like, there's not a lot of coaches favorite. that can get out there and, and, and just throw and move in your footwork. And, and, I, and I said, Bobby, who is this guy? And he goes, let me introduce you to it. And you were just so cool about it. And, 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 uh, and I said, hey, do you, are you a baseball guy or what? And you said, yeah, I just got back from Arizona last night. And I said, so did I. And it, it, it was super cool. And then your girls were out there just playing catch. And, and the thing that I loved it, you guys were having fun. <laughs> you guys were just having fun. And, and, um, I, I, and then you said, hey, if you want to come out to a practice next week, uh, you know, you're, you're more than welcome. So I went out. Uh, it was 18 goal practice. And Don was out there, uh, Norm and uh, Katie. And I was like, who is this kid? And I was Katie Medina. And I said, Medina. And I was like, yeah, you know, and, and it, you guys were just so relaxed, having fun. So I, I think just wanting to play, you know, there, there's times where you see players and, and, and they're not having fun and it just takes away from everything. And just to see you guys out there, uh, it, it was pretty awesome because, you, you know, uh, you, at a younger age, you see kids that are just working so hard and, 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 and it's great, but they're not having fun. So just being around George and the players, it's just, uh, it's so contagious. And everybody was out there that day at that practice. And it was just pretty cool to see. So I said, hey, I want to be like that guy right there. And, and uh, you know, just the fact that uh, you're out there. And as a matter of fact, uh, God, maybe, I don't know, maybe it was about five years ago, uh, my daughter went to a, a Cal State Fullerton camp. And, you know, it was all day camp. And, and um, yeah, I think we had a break at noon. And you were out there taking BP. I think there was some big guy out there pitching underhand to you. And, dude, you were launching balls. I'm like, who is this guy hitting like 400 feet? And I was just like, yeah, you know, just loving it. And, again, that doesn't change even today, you know, the smile and the relationship you have with Katie. Uh, it's pretty awesome to see. He still yeah. got it. He still well, got I still it. Remember, I still remember uh, Normie and Don out there. Yeah, it wasn't, they weren't there to see me, man. They were out there to see the Katies and the other kids that they wanted to grab, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that, that whole synergy and the way all that worked out and all those relationships. And again, for, I want to say the betterment of the industry, right? And it's been, man, time flies, you guys. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy just how fast things go by. So it's kind of the chicken or the egg question, right? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? So is it, is it soft hands come first or does, I, obviously there are things that are, that are special to certain athletes and certain types of players, right? But the chicken or the egg theory, it's like so many coaches are, when they yell out, you know, focus or relax, but tension is a, is a result of stress. And so what are we doing as coaches to create that, that relaxation, right? To create that mindset. Is it a conscious thing at a, at one, at certain level, uh, you know, Katie's experienced everything that this game has to offer. And at a certain level, it's a very conscious, um, mind game, right? Sports psychologists, mental coaches, and different things like that. But to an eight and 10 year old, you know, it's just being relaxed. So it's, it's the one takeaway that I want coaches to understand that, you know, incorporating your practices, whether it's competition, whether it's uh, getting out there and doing it yourself as a coach and letting them see that you can do it or you can't do it, but keep things relaxed because I think that is so important. So what would you uh, three say, if I was to ask you, what are the top two to three traits that you notice instantly in, a, in the highest level middle infielders? What comes to your mind? What are the top two or three things that you're gonna see that are going to tell you, well, this is, this is something else here? George, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a mindset, right? I think that's the number one, you know. The way they carry I, I, themselves? The way they carry themselves, absolutely, yeah. Especially after a mistake. You know, when I was in college, I played with a guy, a great shortstop guy got drafted, I think by the Detroit Tigers in a high round. But uh, he would always struggle after a mistake. You know, he'd kick a ball and uh, Araujo go to short, you know, and there I go. But <laughs> this guy just couldn't function after he made mistakes. You know, he couldn't re he had a really hard time recovering. So, again, at the higher level, I think that's key, right? It's, it's, it's man, how, how is the, the kid going to react mentally, right? Is he going to be able to play at the big stage, you know, and play at, at the College World Series? You know, that's what I'm kind of looking at at that point. 
Um, and again, it comes, it comes to, you know, we, we talk about hands, we talk about stone hands and I call them cement feet, right? You guys, some guys have cement feet and, and, uh, stone hands and one or the other. And some guys or girls have both, man. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, if they have both, they're pretty, you know, hopefully they get DP a little bit or something, but it's tough, you know, it's tough to really develop that when they're 18, 19 years old to really fix that. You know, we do go through some mental training stuff that helps a lot. Um, you know, just like in hitting, I know you talk about focal points and stuff like that, Tony. With that, we do the same thing in fielding. You know, we talk about focal points before a ground ball or before a pitch is made and all that stuff. We really go over that to create that relaxation in an infielder. Um, so the hands are definitely for sure. And you know what, you know, this, I don't know, it's just me. I think sometimes I'm a little unorthodox on how I think about infielders, but flat out grit, man. You got to see a kid and how they tag and how they they move around, right? How they turn the double play and do they stay in there or they bail out on hard hit ground balls or, uh, or balls from the outfield, right? Or balls from the catcher if they're middle infield, do they get out of the way and then allow that runner to go to third or they do whatever it takes to block that ball, you know, or third baseman, same thing, throw from the outfield. What does he do or she, you know, what do they do? Did they give up that run and not be tough and not be gritty? You know, I, that's just my personality. So I look for those sure. kind of kids. But sure. Uh, I think that, I that's really problem. important. That's really important. It's like the kid that, hey, she doesn't know uh, exactly what the ball's going to do. And so forget the form. She's just going to drop and block it with her face because she wants to make the play right. I mean, we played with players like that. And it's, it's, it's awesome to see, you know, when players. And that's, make, that's a great example of Katie, right? I play, mean, right? Yeah. I mean, she would just make plays. You know, she would make plays. She'd get always in front of it. Dirty. Yeah, always got dirty. You know, she was just always gritty and always. It, she wanted to win and she wanted to block the ball. And um, so that's another thing that stood out right away. I mean, she'd do whatever it takes. I think that might've come from that black belt stuff that you ended up getting, but it's uh, it was a, definitely a trait that not everybody has. Right. Katie, and what, what would you say as far as it may be peers that you played against, right? That you noticed that other uh, uh, shortstops that you kind of admired how they played the game and stuff. So what come, and, and I don't know if I can officially announce that you may be entering the coaching ranks of, of this sport, right? I will. Okay. Yes, it so, is official. <laughs> all right. Awesome. So, so uh, boy, careful, because once you get in this, Katie, you might never get out. So we, we're, we'll keep our eye on you. But, okay, so welcome to the coaching ranks. So whether it's noticing as a peer or something that you would look like when you're out there, you know, working with your teams, what are some traits that you're looking for for middle infielders and make, help them stand out at that elite level? Well, based on what I've seen and um, through experience and going forward in coaching, um, something I look for or something that I would expect from somebody who wants to make it to the highest level as a middle infielder is not only like ownership for the the good for the bad, but also for the good. So owner, owning who you are, what you do, whether it's an error, whether it's a great play, being humbly aware that you know. Your hard work is paying off. But then too, like Coach Short says, being able to come back after failure, whether it be on the field, whether it be in the box, because I feel like that affects you defensively too, if you're, you know, if you take that with you. So somebody who's able to take ownership, um, I think is key. And then too, situational awareness is something that I learned. There's something that I learned very young. It started with George and then um, that I learned with you, Tony. And being Expecting the unexpected is what Coach George always used to tell us. And I think that's key, is being able to be aware of what can happen and how you would react when that would happen. And so I think you always need to be a step ahead as a middle infielder because you don't know what can happen. You don't, and you, as the leader on the field, you have to be prepared. And I think my third thing would, um, it kind of goes into mindset a little bit, but just being being a leader, being able to step up when you need to, when your team needs you. And I know for me, leadership can take on ser several different, um, just kind of, it, it looks different for everybody. But, and for me, I was more of the lead by example. And I think that as a middle infielder, you definitely need to be aware that you're in that position, that people are going to look to you. And you, if you're not up for it, then that's probably not the place for you. It's a position of leadership, right? Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of like what pitching does for certain uh, people, certain players that they might not have this innate leadership, but the position teaches them how to be that. And again, I think mm -hmm. that's another responsibility of coaches, right? So, so again, more mindset and persona behavior type answers, which again, 
you know, do you think it's because those aren't the most glamorous parts of the game to talk about, which is why they're, they're, they're not covered enough, right? And at the grassroots mm -hmm. level and really about engaging, how are our kids walking? They, I have a picture on our wall at the warehouse, Katie, where it's, uh, you are just standing. Like it's the way that you're standing in between pitches, but the way you're standing commands respect. And it's, it's that in between pitch moment that a lot of people rush through. That's actually, mm -hmm. actually when you can see it really slowed down. So Tone, how about you? Like as far as characteristics and traits for top infielders and what, what's on the top of your list? You know, it's interesting too, because when, when, when we do our tryouts, you know, and this is more uh, away from the mindset, but uh, on the physical aspect is uh, how much range do you have? You know, can, can you, how, how deep can you play as a shortstop and be able to cover, you know, up the middle, um, you know, in the five, six hole and that slow grounder that gets behind uh, the third baseman, you know, be, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't have range, you can't play shortstop. Okay. So as you know, as you develop into a, a better athlete, the more range you should have. And, and with that, you know, we talked about understanding and reading the ball, how explosive can you be? Uh, and, and that play that uh, Katie made up the, up the middle and doing that 360 turn, not a lot of players can do that, you, you know, so that, you know, and when you're playing deep and have to move to your left and understanding that your body is taking you away from the play, then you have to, you know, uh, do that 360, put the brake on with your right foot, line your shoulders up. Not an easy play to make, but also too. It's I called the spin five, uh, Tony. <laughs> spin five. Come on, get it right, Tony. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that from you. But also, no, I gotta to see the first four still, but I gotta. That's about the spin five. But go ahead. <laughs> but also too, you know that 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 uh, you, you know in the five six, you know that deep and just being able to backhand and plant and come over the top, and and maybe you you know um, a couple of years ago we were playing against uh, Sean team, Sean Bashir's team, and. Uh, I think it was last year, and he had this shortstop. And the first play off the bat, first inning, ball in the five six, just planted, threw over the top, and just gunned our player. And, and it was a nice play. Next inning, slow grounder that gets behind uh, the pitcher and, and third baseman, bare hands it, arm angle to first base. I mean, when you see a shortstop that that can cover that much ground, that's a top level shortstop. Was that was that a smaller kid, not a real big yeah. kid? That's mm -hmm. Haley White. She's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, I mean, really. Just and she's got those play. things we talked about. She's got that persona stuff that both George and Katie both mentioned. Great kid. But also, too, with Katie, just making it look so effortless, just so easy. And, you know, and, that, and that's what I look for, too. Just, you know, there's players that are going to grunt. Uh, and, and when you can make a play look, uh, a tough play look easy, top shortstop. So that's so let's let's swing it there, right? Let's think of because I think uh, George and Katie's eyes both got big when you started going to physical plays, right? And so let's talk. What are some signature plays? Is that five six hole play over the top where you're going to gun it and you're going to show off the cannon, right? So that's one play. What are other signature plays that when shortstops make you like, okay, they're they're shortstops, but then they're shortstops, right? What are some of those signature plays in your guys' mind? I, I like that slow grounder. Um, you know, there's, there's coaches that like to hit the fungal hard, hard as you can, uh, you're just reacting. But when you hit that ball and have to read the hops, have to read the spin, you got to throw off balance, maybe, uh, incorporate an arm angle. That that's a tough play right there. And not everybody can do that. Fielding you know, and throwing on the run. Absolutely. Absolutely. What about you, Katie, George, signature plays. I think another one is when a slapper hits a one hop over to a shortstop and being able to see how they respond to it. If they're able to read how to grab it, if they're able to, you know, essentially get their body ready to throw for when they hit the ground, because there's some people that will wait to hit the ground to then transfer then to throw. And there's some that can do it in the air. And then when they're on the ground, they just throw it. So I think that separates the good from the great is being able to see how they read the ball when there's not a lot of time. And getting their body started before the ball yes. actually touches their glove. Exactly. As opposed to, kind of see that with catchers, right? Some catchers wait till the ball hits the glove, start the motion forward. Mm -hmm. Those other catchers start moving forward, and then it's just a touch and a transfer. So, you know, I think that that's a great point. George, how about you? Is that signature plays? Yeah, I think the 5-6 hole, right? The 5-6 hole play, man, that's – if you can't make that play, you know, at, at the high end and with the slappers that are around nowadays, it's like you probably won't play – High end Division One and be on a high end Division One team. That five six hole play. There's only a few kids that can make that in in the whole country, um, and, and a lot of them can make it, but maybe they don't have the arm strength. You know, a lot of them might not have the the range, right, to really get in that five six hole like Tony was talking about. Uh, so that's that's definitely a signature play for me. You know, and double play turns too. I love double plays. I think they're just sweet sauce and 
get you out of some big jams, man. And we really focused a lot on, on double plays and uh, the kids that could turn that quick transfer double play. That's huge. For every, every softball double play that happens, I think there's, I don't know, I'm going to say there's five to 10 baseball double plays. They're, they're more rare in softball. So when they happen, they're so, they're so advantageous. They're they, they help out the situation so much more. I'm going to throw well, in the, the, re, the relay, right? I'm going to throw in when the ball is hit to the fence oh. and the middle infielder gets the ball out there, you know, out on the grass and someone's going first to home on you, right? And you got the ball, let's say 120 feet out there on the grass and somebody's just hitting third base and they're going, you know, it, it, it nothing hurts more than watching a middle infielder get exposed and they've got, you know, the arm strength isn't there and the, and the, and the base runner outruns the ball. Right. But when you can put that on them, that is something right there, right. Being able to just kind of, so, so it's a combination of things, right. Everything that we've talked about, the dexterity of being rhythmic when you're turning double plays, the, the one motion plays and being able to read the hop. So Katie, whether it's being able to set your feet, because of the speed of the runner, or you can't set your feet and you've got to stay on the run. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second too as well. But those signature plays I think are important because those are the things that separate, right? You get it, you get an opportunity to compete against the best. So let's say for a national team, right, George, you've got all the best out there or some type of all-star team. What separates when you're out there with all the best? So those are just some things to think about. What do you think about, uh, uh, a corner lateral range versus middle infield lateral range. So what are those numbers for some coaches out there that were, okay, so what does that mean? If a kid has three to five step range, is she a corner? Is it five to seven for a middle? So how would you describe that? George, I'll start with you so that coaches can help identify in the future who's going to be that, that top level shortstop or who might be a better corner because of that one or two steps, those one or two steps. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, at the, at the high level, you know, at, at the higher level, a lot of your corners are ex shortstops, right? You know, they, they just are. I know, you know, when we're looking for the international teams or whatever, most of them are ex shortstops and they have that shortstop type range. As far as a step, you know, that, 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 uh, accounted a number to the step, I guess I've never really sat down and counted it. I just know, and I see, okay, that kid's got range, right? She covers, you know, that much ground, uh, in that amount of time. Uh, and again, that's just from being around it a long time, but, mm -hmm. Uh, you're, you're, you know, and I'll talk about another one in, in the organization, in your organization, right? I played for you guys back and she played at UCLA and uh, Brie Tatalafua, you know, she, she had some good range and can move side to side pretty well. You know, she had a few little arm injuries here and there at later on in her career, but good footwork and she could make that slow roller play like Tony was talking about one step throw as opposed to two or three steps. Right. Um, and there's just some great, great plays there. We got a little Bria. We got a little Bria. Oh, man. Okay, hold on. Stay with me, people. It's coming. Oh, there's a Katie play. We'll come back to that. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's a little Bria tot. There it is. Oh, there it is. I, I love this play. George, what do, you, what, do you, what do you call this play? Just on the run. One, one leg, get rid of the sucker ball, you know, get, get rid of the sucker and get that runner out. But, but we, we work, we used to work on that play all the time. You know, I don't know if you remember, Katie, but one step yes. as, a, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to two or three steps, right? She feels this ball on the outside of her body. Her brain's just going to have her adjust her feet to take two or three steps, but she's feeling it towards the center of her body, which is going to allow her to, uh, to uh, just take one step and that's huge and that's something that I look for a lot who can do make this play because Jesus man these kids these slappers nowadays these sneaky bunners and stuff they'll get you if you can't make that play well and I think that's an important point because it's almost for me it's almost like game controllers I think I call that the left right throw right because oh yeah. we're not on this one yet but there she's fielding on the left and throwing off the right but so many fielders don't make this play it's a slow roller right in front of them right? Yep. It's not to the left, right? Something to the left, they continue, they can stay on the run, but it's slow. And when you see, so what I'm doing right now is breaking down some videos for certain players to let them see that when they set their feet and come up and pump and fire, man, that base runner's taking two to three steps on them, right? And then they're beating it out. A right-handed mm -hmm. batter is, is beating it out by half a step when they're a good athlete, right? And so this is just such a quicker way to get rid of the ball. And I remember the first time that I saw you work with some players and teach them this. And I just thought, man, that's a great play because up until this, I was just a conventional one motion, kind of stay on the run through it. Katie yeah. that. But this particular play, I call it left, right throw is huge. And if you look at the speed of the ball, coaches just roll the ball to them. You don't need to hit anything. If yeah. this is that, that slow mm -hmm. roller that Tony was talking about, it's not a fast hit and they've got to come get it right. They've got to come get it and then throw off that. Yeah. Right. That, that's a great point right there because I see, I do see some coaches working on it and, 
you know, they're working on the play, but the one, they're not going, they're not the whole, the whole reason of that play and that can happen is you got to be super aggressive, right? That's one of the plays that you want to be aggressive on. It's a slow roller. You can be aggressive, mm-hmm. not, you know, not other ground balls like some kids, but that's a play you can be aggressive on. Keep after you feel that ground ball, your momentum has to be going towards where you're, where you're heading. So what a lot of kids will do, and this is for the coaches that are out there is they'll get ready to field and then their body, instead of continuing to go forward, they'll want to angle to force space. Once that happens, you slow down so much, you're probably not going to get that speedy runner. The key is stay aggressive through that ground ball and keep running from where that ball came from. That's, uh, that's just yeah, a Because good... not, not every ball you're going to be able to surround and create a lane towards first base. Sometimes you've got to – it's like a bunt, right? Look what uh, big leaguers go on the bunt. They barehand it, and then they're falling over afterwards. So I think you know, that's – You know, a, what's interesting on that point. too, George, is coming from baseball, you know, you're always taught to round the ball, get on the right side. And soft, you got to get it and get rid of it. And mm-hmm. and I see a lot of coaches teaching the banana, you know, and, and you just don't have a lot of time. You, you just got to, you know, go where that ball takes you, uh, continue your momentum going. And But you got to work on it, like you were saying. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight because, again, coming from baseball, you're always taught to get around it and you want to, you know, uh, try to go through the ball to your target. But in that situation right there with Bree, you, you, it's full 100% speed going straight. And Katie, that, that, that's a signature play for you, that one motion play through the ball. I mean, that was always beautiful when you made that. So what was that like for you? I mean, there's times when you got to show the cannon, right? So play to your right and you got to quick turn it around and throw it hard. But then there was those plays where you're actually on the run. And I think what a lot of infielders and coaches don't understand is that, especially when you have a strong arm, I found that fielders with strong arms, they always want to throw the ball hard. So when mm-hmm. it's a slow ball in front of them, they'll come and they'll get it. And then they'll plant their feet because they want to fire the ball from behind the pitcher's circle as opposed to just trusting it, letting your feet continue to shorten the distance. And even though it's a little flick, they don't realize that you're actually getting the ball to first base quicker. So how would you describe making those plays and what it was like for you? I, I love those plays. I love those plays because they show um, your skill level and they show um, just what kind of touch you have and the arm angles that you have. I know for me, I always worked on my several different arm angles, whether it be almost like scraping the floor. I know a lot of people are always like, are, are you sure your knuckles are okay? You, you, I'm sure you got some dirt there. But it was always, um, for me, like... I loved being challenged, and I think that was one of the plays that you don't, I mean, on the run, you don't know what can happen. You know, you don't know if it's going to take a bad hop or what's going to happen. So it's one of those reactive plays where you just have to kind of go with it and then also have the um, just mentality to know that you don't need to overpower it since you're already going to first. So I think it kind of just shows how much you practice, how much you take pride in your work and everything when you're able to get that play. Couple of highlights of some one motion plays, kid. We know. That's sweet. Oh, that's so good. And sis, I, you know, I'm going to say if sis, if sis is throwing on a radar gun, she's not going to hit the high numbers. She can get the ball to first from the deeper slots. That's that's an example right there, George. One of those ones. I'm just going down to make a play, right? Yep. She's almost like yep. going down like an outfielder right there to 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 block it. Hands are so quick with everything she does. And that's the key. You know, I'll even speak for Katie on this. And if you want to disagree with me, Katie, you can. And you want to. But, you know, I, Katie had a good arm, but she didn't have one of the greatest arms out there. Uh, am I, you know, I mean, she just got rid of the ball really quick and, and saved time. You know, it's like hitters that have a hitch in their swing that just takes too long. And Katie didn't have too many hitches. You know, as Sissy, too. You watch Sissy, and I've watched her play, and, and she's played, you know, against, you know, at, the school where I, where I coach at, but, um, you know, it's not like you're, you're, you're seeing one of the greatest arms of all time there. You're just seeing a good athlete making gritty plays and getting rid of the ball. That's a good example of one right there, a little short little step and she just gets rid of that thing. And that's the key. I call it getting starting the race between the ball and the runner. You know, you start that race. Go ahead. No. Yeah. You start that race between the, between you know, between the ball and the runner, get the ball in flight as soon as you can. And the ball will always beat that runner if you do it efficient, efficiently uh, and quickly. Accurately. Now you let that play there. That's, you can talk about this play, Tony, but that's, you'll see her short little quick feet here. Right. So we've got, we've got the triangle, right? We've got, we've got the, the, the flat back, right? The hands are out. She brings it in. She brings it into her center point. She turns it around, gets it out. And again, and we're talking about, I think it was a right-handed batter, right? So, so, and I think it's something we were talking about too, adapting to the speed of the play, adapting to the speed of the runner, knowing when you've got to get rid of that ball and adapting. So, you know, it doesn't do any better to get rid of it and you're throwing him out by three or four steps. 
But that's a Katie, Katie Medina esque play right there, right? Just inverting it and turning around. I think that was the spin six. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we got to write that one down. Oh, we, we'll make we'll, we'll get one like that. We'll get what we'll spin six going. That's it. The spin 132, something like that. Good stuff, you guys. I appreciate that. So let me ask you this: If they're, uh, you know, I'm I'm a coach. I always try to empower coaches because they're so. Listen, good instruction is good instruction, right? But we want to empower coaches because what what are we doing that they can do as well too? So what are your top two or three drills? If I was to ask you, look, you really if, if you could only do two or three drills with a group of infielders, right? What drills are you going to do? Or Katie, when you're out there and you get uh, get going with your practices and and you know, have you thought about that? Like what drills, what types of, of, of movements are you going to work hard at creating? So top two or three drills in your minds for, and especially for the younger level coaches, right? Because we want to develop that sense of rhythm. We want to develop that sense of certainty and stuff like that. So I'll start with you, Tone, on this one. Top two or three drills. Uh, like we talked about last time, I think it's important. We, we've talked about this over and over today. Quick hands. So we have a quick hands drill, trying to just redirect the ball fingertips up and just not catching the ball, just trying to get the ball from your glove to your hand without closing your glove. Uh, that, that's definitely one of the drills I work with uh, young players. Uh, short hops, just, short hops is going to help you understand hops. You got to understand hops. You don't want to run yourself into an in-between hop uh, because lack of reps. Uh, and, and that's something I want to ask you too uh, about reps uh, a little bit later. You know, how important are reps? Are you getting enough reps in there? So quick hands, short hops, and even as they get a little older, arm angles. Uh, you, you don't want to start working your arm angles, 18 gold, 18 U. You know, you, you want to make sure slowly but surely get the head down, you know, uh, fingertips to your target. Keep it simple. But again, you, you know, muscle memory is going to take over, you know, over the top, over the top. And sooner or later, you got to start getting down there and start throwing from different angles, especially at a younger age in softball. You know, baseball, bases are a little deeper. Softball, we got to be a little quicker. Not too young, you know, of an age because all these if you if you start working arm angles at a young age, that's all these kids want to do. This takes effort. Come here, here, you know. But down here, it's not a lot of effort. Just you know, all you're doing is just slinging it. So quick hands, arm angles, and short hops. You know, and listening to you say that, it's it's almost like I want coaches to understand too that accentuate what they're doing naturally with with the uh, mechanics right let the mechanics accentuate what it is we want them to do naturally rather than make everything so controlled and so mechanical that we've lost their natural move i mean every we all agree that the most natural infielders are the ones that are most pleasing to the eye to watch so why wait until they get through all this stress and stress and learning things it's like hitters right and then at some point they learn to relax their last couple of years of playing but really kind of build upon that so uh what about you george what would you say a couple of uh you know, you top two or three drills for, for working with infielders. Well, you know, I, I, shoot, I think they're all important, right? So, I mean, I can have a list of, they're all important. You got to spend a lot of time uh, with, with all the drills. And but you only uh, get, it's like a game show. You only, only get, get three, two man. Or three that's, drills. that's it, man. You got six infielders. I, I guess you I'll, get two I'll or three you know, no I definitely have to go with arm slots. You know, that's a skill that has to be developed and accuracy. And I, I don't know if you saw that picture I sent you of Katie, but she had that real short little arm slot. I was throw. looking for that right now. She was the one throwing from her knee, right? Yeah, yeah, that was great. And I remember you guys working on that, you know, going, you know, with, with Normie too, right? Katie working it with sure. Normie and Lexi Robles and those kids just working on a short little arm angle throw. So the slots is definitely very important. Um, dailies, you know, call them dailies or everydays, you know, your backhands. You know, one that I, I do a lot and I make sure, and I just started doing this maybe like three years ago is one hand drills. Uh, I have them put a ball, I get them with a ball in their throwing hand and you know, you just flip them a short hop or a ground ball, but they have to feel it with one hand outside the body and then they throw the ball that's in their hand. So I've kind of done that one a lot and it's really helped a lot with, uh, with uh, them using one hands, right? They get so focused on using two hands all the time that using the two hands is very well. So, you know, those, those are the big ones, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing, if we're, if we are talking to coaches that are out there, I think, uh, you know, and I'm going back to Tony here, uh, you know, I, I do remember that. Remember you coming out to the practices and the workouts and all that and doing that work, right? That leg work to get better. Uh, we do coaches and in, in international, we go to the conventions and we watch and we watch, watch other people. Uh, they do their homework. I remember Katie's coach, Kenny, when Katie got there, she's, she, he's like, George, what, what do you do? Like, what, what kind of drills do you do? So I gave him drills, you know, but he picked up the phone and called. Um, I think it was a cement drill and all the girls at Florida hated it or something. I don't know, but Katie liked that drill. But, you know, they, they, they picked it reminded the me of you, yeah. but then everybody else hated it. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, no, he called me, you know, and we pick up information. And I think that's, if I'm going to give an advice on not so much a drill, but man, pick up the phone and call and, and collaborate with each other. Right. And, you know, you know, Tony's on the screen right now because he did all that work. And a lot of people don't know that Tony, right. That you come and you've done your leg work and you've done a lot of stuff before being on the screen right now. Well, so I remember um, that to that, me is, that, that, that first workout with the firecrackers and, and, and Katie was at shortstop and, and you guys were playing catch and it was just fun to watch you guys play catch. And it was a, a, a really low key environment. No, and nobody getting aggressive, just, you know, the players are out there doing their thing. But one thing I didn't like is you guys were doing hitting in the beginning. And I was like, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, for a couple hours. And finally we got to defense and I was like, yes, it was just, again, fun to watch. Just Absolutely. Fun to watch. You know, on that same note, before you, you get to Katie here, um, I was watching a video. I was watching Serena Williams practice. They were had a, this documentary thing on her coach. And he really isolated everything, man. They were working on forehands, right? He would just toss tennis balls and she would hit tennis balls after tennis balls, the forehand, they switched to the backhand and over and over just repetition of doing it right. Isolated, slowing it down, uh, not trying to rush through it. I thought that was pretty cool on Serena and, and her coach. That was Look at that guy trying oh, to the 12 under. <laughs> but, but, but here's something, and then, I'll, and then I'll get back to Katie here in a second. But if you look at Tony's drills, right, and this is something, again, I want coaches to understand. If you want to purify the movement, don't stand back and hit full-length fungos. Yeah. Look what we're doing. I mean, what is the space involved here? You're talking about 100 square feet, right? So it's not, it's not a lot, just simple. But you're repeating <laughs> the same thing over and over and over. And every now and then, this guy pops in like he's trying to make the team. But you got you got to appreciate when they're out there having fun with you, right? Oh uh, yeah. But it's it just makes a big simple, difference. simple stuff. So, Katie, how about you? What are some drills that you'd see you starting with your your infielders and kind of your absolutes or, or dailies, as George says? Well, I definitely think roller drills will be the first thing that I'll inco incorporate. It's just like Coach George said, like you guys have said before, repetition, repetition, <laughs> being able to know what your body's doing. And then um, another one that I actually I'm going to take from George is uh, something I used to do when we were little rocket drills. And I, it helped me substantially with my reaction time. And I would love to incorporate that. So um, it's when he comes up closer and he just kind of hits them a little bit harder, but <laughs> it made me the fielder that I was and with my reaction time. And I'd love to incorporate that. You know, th this is something just a visual Rocket for drills, coaches yeah. to see. I yeah. mean, th these are drills that people can watch and replicate, right? So, again, just just simple, yeah, right? And, and the thing that I think people don't realize is that, again, you can watch anywhere from 2 to 10 to 20 of these repetitions, and so many of them look like the one before it. So Katie knows that I'm into, like, this rhythmic. Like, for me, it's always mm -hmm. going to be like a, a team catch, a diamond catch. So working in, in synchronicity with other groups so that you're constantly learning each other's arm angles, but you're also – listening to each other communicate, right? And you know who's communicating louder, who's not. But so many of the best drills are just simple, people. It doesn't have to be, you know, if you think about the state of mind these kids are in, um, and again, if you watch these videos, Tony's not, I was going to say, he's not stopping every five seconds to talk, and then he stops right there to talk. <laughs> but, but so many coaches, well, what? As soon as somebody makes a mistake, then they've got to step in, and, they, and here we go with six minutes of explaining things, right, rather than, you know, again, just kind of reformat the drill. One of my favorite phrases is if the drill's not successful, change the drill, right? Because success breeds success. When you do things successfully, you expect to make it play, make a play. And bottom line is, uh, though there was a guy that I coach with that George knows, and we played for some great, uh, great coaches in the past, but one of my college coaches used to say, there are 75 ways to make a double play. You want to know the best way? Make it. Just make it and make the yeah. play. Cause bottom line is Katie, when you're in the college world series, right. And that's what I was kind of taper down here towards the end here is as we talk about your experience in the college world series, right. Did, was that, and did you find your pocket right away? Like what was the assimilation to that stage, the pressure of the games, the crowds, the TV crowds and everything else. Was it just a matter of once you got out there, you kind of got into your moment. Was there a little bit of adjustment assimilation? So what was that like? Because, Watching you on that stage was absolutely amazing. And what an opportunity that so many girls dream about being able to play on that stage, right? It was such a wonderful opportunity. Um, but quite honestly, I thought I would have been a little bit more nervous when I stepped on that field, considering there are so many people watching. But I think everything that I had done before that 
helped me prepare for me stepping on the biggest stage of college softball because when I got up there it's like I was meant to be there it was it just came so naturally for me to just be myself up there and just to have fun and I feel like if I would have worked it up if I would have thought that it's something else or that it's just so much bigger than what it was yes it's a huge stage and it's something where everybody wants to get to but I feel like if I play that up in my head to be that way, it would have been a little bit different, but it was just another game, another game with, an, with my teammates, another chance to make a play, another chance to go out there and show them what I'm, what I'm all about. And I feel like that's what helped me is my mindset. And like Coach just said, I'm a very calm person and I just kept being me. And it's what helped me make all the plays that I did at the Women's College War Series. Yes, I made errors, but I came back from them. And um, it just, I treated it as another day. And, and just being very grateful that I was able to wear that uniform on that biggest stage. What are one or two, let's say one, what's, what's one of your strongest memories from all of your College World Series experiences? What comes to your Does mind one? when I say that? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so when I ask you to one, if it, if it goes to two, it goes to two. But what comes to the surface? Because you had so many of them, right? So amongst all the highlights, what comes up? Could have been a team thing, could have been an individual thing. I know you're team oriented, but just what comes to your mind I'm when I say that? I'm very team oriented, so. I know. Can I do one of each? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, um, I have to say the dog pile and just the feeling of the second national championship. That was just, I feel like the first one, I was, I was crying so much because I was so happy that I feel like I didn't take it all in. But that second one, it's like I had been there before. And I took it all in and um, it just was amazing just getting to be surrounded by they, like my sisters. And for us reaching that milestone and all that hard work that we did that year to get it, because it's not easy, especially after coming off of a, cha a national championship the year before, everybody expects so much from you. And so it just icing on the cake for that one. That one was such a wonderful experience. Okay, I'm gonna say two from, for individual because one of them's on the field, one of them's not so much. Um, one memory that I will forever be grateful for and think about is I was the very last one on the field, 2015, holding the national championship trophy. And I was on there for, for like five minutes and I sat at shortstop and I just watched the scoreboard and I just kind of took it all in. And it was such a beautiful moment because it, I feel like I just came like full circle in that moment because I had dreamed of that for so long. And it was so nice for it to be my reality. And it was the, the best way that I could have ever imagined like hanging up my cleats and ending my career. So absolutely amazing. And then because I'm on the call with you, Tony, I'm going to say my other one is um, the diving play that I made against Nebraska in the, I think the 14th inning, um, because let me get into this, because I had the opportunity to make a play like that in on my sophomore season with you in high school, and I didn't make it. And this is talking about bouncing back from essentially failure, right? I could have easily let that get to me. I could have easily just been like, you know, what? I'm never going to make that play. Well, Tony said when I got back to the, in the dugout, we could have been off that field if you would have got dirty. We could have got off that field a little bit earlier if you would have made the play, if you would have at least made the effort because you can get there. And I doubted myself and I didn't make the play at first. And then I worked hard. I worked hard to get that range. I worked hard because I knew the next time that play happened, I was going to make it. And that's what happened. And I knew wow. the next time I was going to get dirty and that I was going to make my pitcher proud and make my team proud and knowing that I'm able, I have their back. So that's another one that sticks out. And I had that one here, right? And so, and that was a play that, you know, and, and I know George remembers this from the days, but we call it the triangle, right? So when we talk about the triangle, let's see if I get it here. And we talk about this space in here where my cursor is, right? And that, and that lane of a shortstop, I expect you to go into this wall to make a play, right? And to be mm -hmm. honest with you, all of our crazy methods is, is not about our level. You and I were talking last week about uh, some some different plays and some championship games down at the grassroots level, but it's about this level. And so if your learning curve during that play with me led to this, because that's in the 14th inning against Nebraska, 7-7, with the winning run on second base. So how many times have we said, look, you don't lay it out for that one, and then she bleeds went in over the third baseman's head and then game winner, uh, Hager jams her with a screwball or something, right? So still a great pitch, but we bleed one in. And so Katie, that, that's, that's pretty cool. And I even had that sucker queued up, but proud to be a part of your learning curve there because, you know, wouldn't you say to all in middle infielders, I mean, don't you hear your teammates always just yelling, lay it out on every ball that's like that, right? Yep. Lay it yeah. out. And even if you don't, it's about your effort, right? It's about effort. Exactly. Right. 
that's pretty awesome. Thank it's you. About making sure that your your team knows that you have their back and that you're going to give it their all, you're all for them. You're going to get dirty for them. That's absolutely mm -hmm. great. All right, guys, we are at, at one hour. So I'm going to go 30 seconds each and I'm going to ask George, you know, what's a closing uh, piece of advice that you could give our coaches out there for working with their younger players, developing infielders. So what's, what's 30 seconds of advice you can do to give them to kind of help them with their, with their success? Yeah, I think identify, you know, identify what you, each kid can do and put them in the best chance they have for success, you know, and that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, they're going to play at a high level. Where would they, where would they play? That doesn't mean they don't play other positions or anything like that, but identify right away what a kid can do and what her makeup is and how to, how to, push her buttons or how to, you know, motivate her or motivate your team. Um, and then continue to continue to learn, you know, and again, Tony's a perfect example of that, man. You just continue to learn all the time. Um, and I guess that's what I would leave him with. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Get out there and watch it. Watch your, watch those coaches that you emulate guys. I mean, it's, it's, it's really important. Katie, what advice do you have for coaches out there? And, and again, you getting into the coaching ranks, but taking your experiences from a player, what, what is it that you want to pass on to make sure that coaches understand it's really important when they're relating to their players? Well, I think something that we've um, talked about already is just make it fun, make it to make it an environment where a kid feels safe to learn. A kid feels like they want to learn when where they they know that they can thrive and where there's so much potential and where they can find that passion inside of them. And I feel like having an environment where, you know, it is something where you allow them to learn on their own, but also be there to um, just kind of coach them up when you need to. And so I would say bottom line is just make it fun. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Beautiful. And Tone, what do you got to wrap it up? I, I would say just as a coach, just, uh, just understand that everyone's different. All the kids are different. Nobody's the same. And, you know, understand, uh, you know, how important it is to, to know what a kid can do, but also probably more importantly is to know what they can't do. And, and uh, understand also that failing is part of it. So don't expect them to be perfect every time. You know, if you're uh, not failing, you're not getting better. So understand that as a coach and, and good things to happen. Awesome. Listen, you three, thank you so much. I, I got to tell you that, you know, our, 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 uh, the relationships that we have over time and within the industry, that being said as, as one part of it. But what I really like about this conversation is that everyone on this call that I'm looking at right now gets it done. Right. There are levels to this game. And so you can be a good person and be a champion. You can be at the top of the food chain and be courteous to people and encourage people and include them. It's not always about being vicious. And again, it's one of the things where someone like George gets the, the appreciation doesn't come in as soon as it should, because you've never presented yourself, George, with that boom, asshole, dominant alpha, whatever it is. And you're you. And so what ends up, ends up happening is the cream rises to the top over time. And it's so powerful. But all three of you get it done at the highest level. Uh, Katie, thank you so much for surprising George with This Is Your Life. Because, you know, thank I didn't you know if we were going to be able to do that. That was really, so really fun. cool. She came out and surprised me in Vegas last week, George. So it was yeah. cool. And I just told well, her. I'll tell you what, you couldn't see it on the screen. But, I, I mean, you, Tony and Tony can, you know, this is, yeah, I had a tear in my eye for sure. That was a happy moment and probably one of my cool. best moments uh, you know, of all time. Top well, 10 a, for sure. I'll tell I'm you a, that. I'm going to clip it. I'm going to clip it and put it on a loop on Twitter now so everyone can see uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Thanks, Tony, for that. For so, so, yeah, no, awesome, you guys. So I just really, really appreciate it. Uh, care about you a lot. Have a great holiday season. And, you know, don't be surprised if I give you another ring because I think we got a lot more to talk about when it comes to defense and stuff. So stay thanks safe out that. there and keep yourself busy. And thanks again for your time, okay? Thank thanks, you. Guys. Right, Thank you. Thank you. It was a blast. Take care. Happy holidays. You guys. Same to you.